Hello and welcome to FO Live as we ask what are the paths towards peace in Yemen. Uh, today's event is brought to you by Fair Observer in association with the One Podcast. Uh, today we're joined by a panel of eminent Yemenis to discuss the conflict in that country which has been raging since March 2015 and the possible paths towards its, its resolution. Uh, Khalid Hussein Al Yamani is a former um, the country's former ambassador to the United Nations and Yemen's former Minister of Foreign Affairs. Uh, Munir Saeed is a retired businessman and uh, political activist who co-founded the TAWQ, uh, which is a Yemeni non-partisan political movement. Uh, Sama Al Hamadi is a Yemeni analyst and media commentator. She's the director of Yemen's Cultural Institute for Heritage and the Arts. And Nawal Al Magafi is the BBC special correspondent and an award winning filmmaker. So, welcome to you all today. Uh, we would like to add that we reached out to the Foreign Ministry in Sana'a and the Southern Council in Aden, um, but they declined our invitation to take part. Um, of course, we would love to hear all perspectives, so please do write any comments or any questions here on Zoom or on Facebook, and we'll put those to the panelists. Mr. Yamani, if I can start with you, um, I know these are your personal views and not those of the Yemeni government, um, but as a former ambassador and, and minister, um, could we ask you for your take on the conflict and those possible paths towards peace? Uh, let me just tell you this. Um, after six years of war, the international efforts to address Yemen conflict gained momentum now with the new administration commitment to end the war in Yemen. And this is very important element uh, in, in, in the total equation of the crisis in Yemen. But the US good intentions are not enough to change the complex multi-layered crisis magnified with regional dimension and increasingly threatening to drag Yemen and the region down the path of permanent instability and despair. One must only look next door to Somalia as a vivid example of how challenging the peace process can be when a war economy and warlords drain an entire nation. In, my, in, 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 in any of the protracted conflicts, the first step starts with the cessation of hostilities. And this is how we see it in the UN, how the international law also uh, approach uh, such um, big conflict and protracted one. Especially today, uh, as we see what's uh, going on in Marib, this is an urgent call. It's a call from this meeting, from all the intellectuals in Yemen, that's enough of war, stop the war in Marib, stop the war anywhere, and go and sit down and talk about the future of Yemen. So I'm afraid that focusing the international community, the US administration, focusing on the regional dimension of the crisis in Yemen without bringing the concerned parties who agree on the best settlement in accordance with UN Security Council resolutions can drive Yemen into a low intensity conflict and a forgotten war. No one will take care of, of Yemen if, if there is no uh, interest in bringing the parties to, to the conflict. Unfortunately, and this is I keep saying every time, the parties involved on the ground are too focused on a zero-sum game approach to pursue a complete victory and are not yet ready to engage in a political settlement. This is especially true with the Houthis. Uh, I'm against also, I will, I, will, I will explain few of this discussion that is going on. I'm against any attempt to address the Yemeni conflict outside the United Nations. And, and, and there, there has been so many uh, attempts to derail the UN uh, track and bring it like uh, similar to what happened in, in Syria by the Suchi process and bring it to, to other, other elements of the international community out of the United Nations. And I'm also against any recommendations to create an international mandate to enforce peace on the ground, which is what they call it the international administration. I'm against that also. Yemenis should decide the best approach to accommodate each other and the agreed national dialogue outcome can serve as the platform for future formula. 
supporting the UN-led uh, efforts to impose permanent ceasefire, open humanitarian channels, restore long dormant peace talks, and work with the UN envoy and all the parties uh, on the ground to push for diplomatic resolution. This will be always the best because Yemenis can talk to each other in international format with a local format, but they need to find a, a solution to their grievances. Now, what options we have? We have in, in, in front of us for quite some time, for 10 months, 12 months now, uh, the joint declaration. The, the special envoy of the Secretary General was working in that, with that joint declaration for quite some time. And we agreed on, on, the, on almost the text. And the text is very simple. It's based on cessation of facilities, some trust building measures, and the third step will be sitting down to look into a permanent uh, settlement to the crisis. Now, the second option, uh, unless we can sit down and, and agree on how to accommodate each other in Yemen, there is also an idea that we started to work in 2018, and a, we, we call it the, the governmental surge. The, the governmental surge in Aden was an, an, an idea of bringing international peace building and state building efforts on Yemen areas controlled by the government of Yemen, empowering the government of Yemen. And this is not that I'm favoring the government of Yemen, but working with the government of Yemen means working against the corruptive practices of the government of Yemen, working with the, to streamline the efforts of the government of Yemen so that they can, the government can service the entire nation, not to service only areas of Yemen. For example, it's very important that the government work on salaries, on healthcare, on humanitarian deliveries. And, and in this, uh, I will jump to the third option that is not, not so welcomed now in Yemen. And, uh, and, and, and it's unfair that uh, this deal was uh, neglected, which is the Stockholm Agre Agreement on Hodeida. The Stockholm Agreement on Hodeida was an attempt to accommodate each other in one uh, place, but uh, neither the UN was presenting a very well uh, designed document uh, on that. If you read the document, you see a lot of flaws in that document. And, um, uh, and the two parties thought that uh, according to their zero sum game, uh, they thought that they are victorious in Hodeida. That's why they couldn't work together. The idea that we, we should have bring together institutions of the state step, step by step, asking the militias to leave the, the city and use the central bank branch in Hodeida to, to pay salaries to, to, uh, to the people in, in, in areas controlled by the Houthis, and, but that failed, of course. Uh, let me just tell you that the focus of that plan or these three options uh, is the UN Security Council. And you know that the UN Security Council in the past uh, tried uh, in using different approaches and failed to shoulder its responsibilities to maintain international peace and security uh, as mandated by the UN Charter. So now the idea is uh, that the US administration by reviving its multilateralism it will be working in the United Nations and the Security Council to bring the, the P5 together. There is a split between the P3 and the P5 and the P2, namely Russia, United Kingdom, and the United States, uh, uh, sorry, France, United Kingdom, and United States, and the other side, Russia and China. We need, we need to bring them together and, and try to uni unite the, the, the voice of the international community and the Security Council uh, to the parties on the ground that enough of war, let's stop peace and, 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 and try to enforce that message by, 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 by the united uh, views. And I think- also, yeah. We might have to wrap up just briefly. Can I just yeah, ask you for your concluding I'm, point? I'm wrapping up now, but and it's very important also that to bring Russia, the important role of Russia, uh, especially with Iran and the Houthis. Uh, if, if, if I will stop here and I still have comments, maybe we'll talk about it 
in their Q&A process. Thank you so much, Mr. Yamani. Um, if I can next go perhaps to Munir Saeed, um, you recently wrote an article for us here at Fair Observer uh, talking about the impact of the US on the conflict, how it deepened the situation, deepened the conflict there, but how the new Biden administration might offer some new hope. Can we just ask you to outline your views, please? Yes, that's a, that's a, uh, a, a two-pronged question that you ask. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for organizing this, both yourself, Claire, and uh, Fair Observer, and uh, Diwan, and uh, thank you to everybody for allowing me to, to, to participate in this. I'm honored by, by, to be present among you. The US historically has not viewed Yemen as an independent sovereign nation on its own right. The US has treated Yemen as an extension of either the US Saudi policy or the US Iranian crisis. And so Yemen in the eyes of Barack Obama in 2015 was readily available to be traded off with the Saudis in Obama's quest for signing the nuclear arms deal. After all, Yemen has always been considered to be the, the, the backyard of Saudi Arabia, and the file is always in the hands of Saudi Arabia. Consequently, the Saudis were given a carte blanche to do as they please in exchange for silence over the Obama's nuclear deal with Iran. Saudis took the US view as license to bomb Yemen with impunity, first as part of Obama's policy to appease the Saudis, and then as part of Trump's policies to fight the Iranians, but never as Yemen in its own right is a sovereign state to be treated and dealt with with dignity, always as an extension of US policies towards others. I have discussed this extensively in my article, but what is it that induced the US and others to relegate Yemen to the position of that poorest Arab country whose peoples deserve being traded off as expandables in regional and international horse trading. The attitudes of Yemen's own leaders, who mostly come, came by the bullet rather than the ballot, Yemen's leaders have never looked at themselves as leaders developing a rich, populous nation able to create international and regional partnerships and be part of a global security network for one of the most important waterways in the world. Yemen leaders have focused their attention in seeking aid to enrich themselves and to compensate for their own incompetence that failed to develop Yemen. And therefore, uh, the, the opportunity, creating opportunity of prosperity to the two for Yemenis was, was completely uh, kept away by corruption in Yemen. Getting aid was easy for the corrupt leaders. They could steal most of it. They could invest a little of it and they didn't have to work for any of it. So it was a very easy pass for the Yemeni leaders. This created for Yemen a, 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 to become an easy victim that nobody paid attention to. The Biden administration is probably the first administration that is looking at Yemen as Yemen in itself and not as part or an extension of Saudi policy. Its decision to appoint its own representative, effectively taking away from the Saudi coalition, the Yemeni file, so to speak, uh, is, is an indication of, Yemen, of Biden's change of, of policy towards not just Yemen, but the entire region. The whole, American relation with the region has been based on focusing on fighting the Iranians, and now Biden is adopting a different attitude towards that. It is now dealing with the situation in a different way. And for Yemen, this is very important because removing Yemen as part of US-Saudi policy and dealing with Yemen as a country by itself that has its own problem and and, and cutting it away from the problems of Saudi Iranian problems and making Yemen a victim of those fights is very important the, to, to lead to peace. Nevertheless, Biden's decision so far is only 
a decision. We haven't seen any, uh, any, any, anything material on the ground. Everything that Biden has done has been announcement, pronouncements. There haven't been any decision on the ground that affect the cause of war. What we need to see now from Biden is to put teeth in his decision. We need to see a Security Council resolution ordering an immediate ceasefire externally and internally. We need to see a lifting of the, of the, of the, of the blockade, the, the entire blockade, air blockade, land blockade, sea blockade. Yemenis have to have access to go back to their country and to start rebuilding their future. This will create the pressure on the fighting and the warring parties to go back to the negotiating table and meet the challenges of the de facto that is going to be created by Yemenis themselves getting back into the country. We need to see a ban placed not just on Saudi Arabia and UAE that Biden has placed, which, which is very good, but a ban placed on other regional players who are funding the militias in Yemen, who are arming the militias in Yemen. Today, we have the number of militias that we do not even know how many there are. And they are roaming everywhere in the country. We do not even know how we will be able to control them. These are being funded by external players. Okay, Manu, we, I think need... we may have to come back to some more of your comments a bit later. Would you like to wrap up just a few in a few sentences? No, just fine. I'll we'll we'll we'll, we'll, exp we'll expand more on the. Oh, point of the very kind. Samara, if we can come to you next, please. Obviously, we've had Mr. Yamani focus very much on the United Nations, Mr. Saeed talking about the US. Uh, what's your take on, on the conflict and those possible paths towards peace? Uh, thank you so much, Claire. Uh, I also would like to say that I'm, I'm glad to be here and to share this panel uh, with this specific set of guests. And I also see a lot of familiar faces in the attendees. Um, and for the sake of time, I will monitor myself to, to make it to the point so that we can engage in a Q&A discussion and to allow Noel some time to speak as well. I don't wanna add too much to what the speakers before me said. So I'll, I'll just go through my main points. I think we can all agree on this panel that the continuation of the war only fuels the powers of the local actors on the ground and continues to, to create a, a more difficult situation to Yemen. Um, I think from that point on, we might have some divergent views, but it's good to agree that we all are ready for peace. I think coming from Yemeni voices, that's really essential. Um, for me, I think there are multiple layers of how this peace is going to work in the future. You have the top layer, which is the international actors. That's really where the UN can, can help bring everyone together. Then you have this, this middle level that interacts with the regional actors who have been very much a part of Yemen's war. And that's where I see the role of the US envoy uh, to Yemen. He has a lot of leverage there. And then finally, you have the bottom level, which is actually the most important level that we can't seem to engage. And I think it's even represented in our in our discussion today, how difficult it was to actually get people from the ground in Yemen to participate in this discussion. I think those are the key st stakeholders on the ground. How do we convince the Yemenis that it is in fact time to seize the moment and stop uh, the war right now? So I think from the, the very top level, we now have the EU supporting the role of the UN and it's time for the permanent members of the United Security Council, namely the UK and France to try and convince Russia and China of uh, the need for peace in Yemen. Norway and Ireland who are the current non-permanent members should definitely play a role. And I think they will very positively play a role in this. Uh, on the middle level, we have uh, the UAE and Saudi very actively engaged by the US envoy to Yemen. He was just in Kuwait and in Qatar. Um, and I think for me personally, I would love to see Oman play more of a role moving forward. And then finally, I'll discuss the Yemeni actors as I get to the next step. Uh, unlike other speakers on the panel, I don't think that all peace efforts should be done within the framework of the United Nations. Um, and I think it's it's also a critique of previous agreements that we have seen. I think that there needs to be multiple tracks of engagement for Yemen. I think the, U, the UN should always play a supportive role, uh, a role of some sort of... Um, Whenever a peace deal is signed, of course, it has to be inaugurated with their blessing and, you know, with the participation. But I think ultimately it is the Yemenis who will decide whether they want peace or not, whether they're ready for it or not. 
And in order for that to happen, I think we, we need to look at the regional level, at the regional actor level. And here's where my previous research for about a year or so has convinced me that Oman can play a key role in this by allowing Yemenis to come and engage in non-official, non-formal, non-structured non, um, conversations about what they want to see in the upcoming period. And I think that Oman can also play a very helpful role for the US and other international actors by bringing uh, the US envoy to Yemen closer to Ansarullah, closer to Islah factions that have no longer agreed with the, with the government of Yemen. So there, there's something that could be done there. And I think when it comes to the local actors, uh, the Yemenis, I think sometimes when, when you have a war that drags on for so long and peace process, uh, peace process building that's been taken on forever, I think sometimes we just wanna go back to the frameworks we created, kind of insert them because now the time is right and keep moving forward. Sometimes that is not ideal. Sometimes you have to stop, reassess, what does Yemen need now? I think that the first thing that the Yemenis on the ground need to realize is that they must seize the moment. This focus on Yemen, this unique attention that's coming from the US to Yemen will not stay there forever. It will be there for three, four months. If they do not capitalize on it, it will not be there. And that would be devastating to millions of Yemenis who have to suffer the consequences of famine uh, and of the devastation of war that's coming in, in multiple forms at this point. I think the US will not be as generous and patient with the actors on the ground. And we started seeing some of that yesterday where the US imposed some, some sanctions on Houthi leaders. And that's signaling that our soft tone and our approach uh, is not gonna always be there. And I think we always need to remember that the US is now looking at Yemen as, my, as the previous speaker just mentioned, it has to do with US-Iranian relations and decreasing the tensions between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Uh, and so if Yemenis cannot understand that they, they are part of that equation, it would be really difficult uh, to move forward. Now, I, I want to look- I'm So sorry, if we could wrap up very briefly. My yeah. wrapping remark. My wrapping remark is that um, right now there's a massive opening. You have uh, the Yemen file in the hands of Khaled bin Salman, who you know had it last year, but because of COVID-19, not much work was able to be done. You have a new Omani Sultan, Qatar is now part uh, back part in the of the GCC, and there's this momentum building in. There's this movement, and I think that the role of actors like myself and other Yemenis abroad who've been working around what's happening in Yemen is to push in that direction, but to figure out a path that's clear so that when we push, it's actually heading in the right direction. So I think with that, I, I will end my remarks and hopefully we can engage in a Q&A. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Samar. I know that the time just disappears, doesn't it, when you've got so much to say, the same with all our speakers, really. Noel, I know that you were recently in Yemen um, speaking to people there on the ground. Um, so as Samar was talking about local actors, perhaps we can ask you a little bit about what people on the ground really hope for in terms of um, some sort of peace process. Of course, thanks, Claire. First of all, thank you so much for allowing me to take part in this. Uh, it's been really refreshing to hear from the other speakers. I've learned a lot myself. Um, as Sema said, it's been really hard to hear from Yemenis on the ground. And so that's really what I focused my work on the last six years. I tried to go to Yemen at least twice a year uh, to, to hear from people there. And, and it's really interesting, but also incredibly depressing to see how things have changed over time for Yemenis on the ground. You know, like we've mentioned, the humanitarian situation has worsened and really quite, you know, life has become unbearable for Yemenis on the ground. On my most recent trip um, in the summer of last year, uh, we focused on the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I went to make a documentary there about how Yemeni has dealt with COVID-19. And I think the way the different regions in Yemen reacted to COVID-19 um, and how they handled it was truly reflective of the strengths and weaknesses of the different authorities or the different warring parties in control of the different parts of Yemen right now. Um, initially, getting in was incredibly difficult. Our team was refused visas by the Yemeni government, and this is something that uh, media agencies continuously face, and that's why it's, it's so rare that we hear from people in Yemen. And so I decided to go in by myself. Um, we traveled across the country. We started our trip in Aden, which is held by the Yemeni government. Um, and I'm going to tell you a bit about what we saw. Uh, we went in and 
And really, it was it was really chaotic in the ground. I think a lot of people have seen pictures from the COVID-19 situation in Aden, the, the graveyards that were overflowing with, with bodies, um, you know, that died of, of the disease. Um, and it was really because of the lack of leadership. You know, we went, there was only one hospital operating. Most of the doctors in the city had fled and it wasn't and it was because they weren't being paid. And in Aden, it wasn't because of lack of funding or lack of aid. It was because of corruption. You know, the Yemeni health minister had, in fact, allocated around $50,000 as a first tranche of funding to support the COVID-19 response. But because of corruption and mismanagement that's rampant uh, in these areas, um, that money was never spent and therefore all the hospitals shut down, except for one that only had two doctors at the height of the pandemic. Um, what we also saw in Aden was conflict between different forces and militias, you know, Munir already mentioned this, but over the last six years we've seen the emergence of multiple militias that are being supported and funded by external actors. Um, and that's also that also hindered the response to COVID-19 in Aden because what we saw was there was constant conflict between these different militias. Um, also aid agencies were complaining of not knowing who was in charge and the fact that the government wasn't present in the city made it incredibly difficult for them to do their work. Um, we then traveled to the north, which is being held by the Houthis. And you know, the situation there was very different. Um, before going in, I, I think there was it was very, very, um, there was barely any reporting on the COVID-19 situation in the North. Uh, and so there was a widespread misconception that COVID wasn't as bad in the North as it was in the South. But what we found was that it was completely untrue. Um, the situation in the North was, was terrible. The disease did spread, but the Houthis had cracked down on all media trying to report on the situation. And it gives you an idea of the power and control they have in this region. Uh, when we got to the north, it took weeks before we were given permission by the authorities there to film openly about COVID-19. And that's not to say that we didn't film, we'd been filming for months, but it was it took months before they gave us uh, proper accreditation to continue our filming. And this disinformation campaign by the Houthis really cost a lot of lives because it made people believe in these regions that COVID-19 didn't exist when in fact it did. Um, although you know, the Houthis also uh, cracked down on neighborhoods that uh, reported cases of COVID-19. And these, you know, aggressive crackdowns stigmatized the, the disease and made people fearful of admitting that they were in fact infected. Um, the one thing that was different in the North was that hospitals were running because aid agencies made sure that they continued on running. But hospitals were actually quite empty, they weren't overflowing. Uh, and that's because of this misinformation and also because of the stigma that was attached to the disease because of the way the authorities there handled it. Um, um, if I can just pitch in, if we can just, again, try to wrap up. Sure, one last point and then, and then we'll wrap up. Um, so, you know, it was clear that they, are, they were an emboldened strong force on the ground as we were covering the COVID-19 pandemic in the North they were also making their way and pushing in Marib. And the reality is that the last six years of war haven't weakened the Houthis, but have helped them recruit, uh, strengthen, and really embolden themselves in the regions they control. So across the board, whether it was in the North or the South, we saw people preparing themselves for the worst, buying their own oxygen canisters, buying their own medicines, because in fact, in the entire country, people feel like they can't rely or, um, rely on the authorities in power. Anyway, I'll leave the rest for the discussion. Thank you so much, Noel, and thank you to all of our speakers for just laying out the context for us. Um, we're now going to go into a question and answer session. So if we can try and keep the answers fairly short and sharp, then we can get through as many questions as possible. We, we've already received gosh, about 20 of them. So it's going to take a while to get through them. Um, the first one is from Duan's, uh, Duan Podcast's co-host. Um, he's called Ali Mahmoud. And he said, we see an escalation across the war fronts and in narratives across social media and media outlets. Are political actors and their constituencies ready to sit at the, at the peace table? And Mr. Yamani, if I can go to you first on that, because you did mention that the actors are too focused on this zero sum game. If you can expand a little on that. I mentioned that the parties to the conflict, they are not ready. 
and uh, there is a sense really and i'm and i agree with mahmoud uh that you will find uh, all 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 over the, the play all over the place people saying that uh, it's not time for peace yet and uh, the argument is that the houthis have the upper hand uh in in the conflict and the government of yemen is in this advantageous uh, situation for them i have a question when and at what time this six of six years of war this was not the fact actually from day one the houthis were on 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 the uh, on or taking on uh, cities and, and 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 towns and advancing over positions of the government because for them war is the question yeah i mean the houthis kidnap the entire nation by force and the only language they understand is the use of force and we play by their terms and there is no way to defeat them using arms and 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 and, and fighting on the ground because you look into what's happening in the liberated areas it's more fragmented today you see stc in the south you see the in the western coast you see another uh, i mean faction controlling you see ties a lot of militias and the only way for us is to defeat them through peace reclaiming the legitimate power of voice of the yemeni people the houthis will go back to their real size in the yemeni politics this is the only way in every time i was talking about peace people say ah this is idealistic approach we will defeat them and they kept saying, saying we need another week we need another month and we will defeat them we will push back look what's happening in marib it's a real carnage thousands of corpses are, are scattered on that mountains why it's all the, the the war for power we need to stop and we need to sit down and we have enough resolutions we have the outcome the national dialogue we have a lot of things that we can agree upon but please i have one last comment if you may don't blame others for our failures we always say the saudis uh, others uh, i don't know what now the 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 the, the, the conditions are think yemen and this is how our old generations used to solve their problems think within the house don't think outside and this is very important i know that the administration will help the new american administration will help into the internal uh, regional leverage but if we think about if the houthis understand that, that they will have a place always very important place in yemeni society and and others can have the same share in power we can sit together and talk uh, peace okay um perhaps i can put that question um and a little other question um to samar because i know you were talking about the regional um regional factions um we've had a question from fuad asakaf asakaf who asks um isn't it obvious that the solution is totally in the hands of the great powers don't they need to change their approach yeah um thank you for that question so for the first question um I would like to say that yes, there are some local actors in Yemen that are showing that they're not ready for for peace, and I think that that's a miscalculation if they don't, you know, take advantage of this moment. Um, but I think that it's natural in peace processes. Right before uh, warring parties sit at the table, they try to expand as much as they can and get as much territory on the ground before they sit at the table. I think this time. Again, there's a huge miscalculation, but as long as there is profit in war, there will always be people who are interested in continuing the war. And I think the first step to preparing people to be at the negotiating table is to dry out outside funds to these local parties, and and that is very possible to do in the in the next upcoming months. So I think for different local actors on the ground, different war and sites of the conflict, there are different types of motivations that can be used because they're not homogenous. Um, and so for sure, each each regional actor can influence a specific local actor uh, in Yemen, and there can be pressure put on them to come to the to the table because ultimately they're also exhausted. This is the sixth year of conflict and they do, in fact, want peace, even though they're not entirely prepared for it. Uh, when it comes to the regional actors, they hold tremendous power. Of course, uh, you know, a huge, you know, huge participant in Yemen's conflict is the Saudi led coalition, Saudi Emirati uh, led coalition. Uh, and I think that they are ready for peace. I think they have come to the point where this war is exhausting for them in the midst of a, of a, 
a COVID crisis in the midst of the drop of oil prices. The Yemen's war is a money, is the money pit. It's not a war that they have managed to navigate smoothly. And as a matter of fact, uh, we are seeing symptoms of a UAE Saudi divide in, in, in Yemen. And that's really difficult to manage if it continues to grow. And I think that's in fact why the US envoy is in the region. And that's why he wants to make sure that this divide doesn't grow even wider in the future. Okay, thank you. Um, we're going to go to a question here from Atul Singh, who's the editor in chief of Fair Observer. He asks, can there be peace without involving Iran in the talks? Um, if not, would some recalibration of US policy towards Iran be a prerequisite to peace in Yemen? If we can ask um, Mr. Saeed that question, please. I think, I mean, if we look at Yemen's history, we have had two long wars. The 1960 war, which lasted for about six or seven years, and that involved Saudi Arabia and Egypt, and this war that involved Saudi Arabia and the UAE directly, plus, of course, the other enablers indirectly. So whenever we have seen external forces involved in Yemen, the problem became bigger, and this did not solve the problem, in fact, extended the wars for a, a long, a, a, a long uh, time. No doubt that the forces in Yemen which are fighting are receiving everything they use in this war from external forces. Whether it is Iran, Saudi Arabia, UAE, we need to get them to stop supporting their, to start sponsoring their own allies within the country. We can always talk and say Iran and Houthi or Iran and Nasrullah, but there are also others who are equally being supported by regional players. This is necessary and that is why it is important to have a United Nations Security Council resolution banning all regional players from becoming involved in the war in Yemen, funding or arming the, the local players. Without that, it will not stop. This war will continue. What we are doing at the moment is, and you can hear this today, we are talking about Marib. The, the other time we we're talking about Hodeida or Aden or Sokotra. We are talking about battles instead of focusing on the war. Of course, if we have the war continuing, you will have battles running around of different intensities, depending on the tactics. Uh, tactical objectives of that particular moment. Today, the tactical objective that's going on in, in Marib is because Ansarullah wants to position itself for the future negotiations. This is clear now. They know that this war is coming to an end and they want to position themselves. Or oh, we had Aydarus of the STC, what he said only yesterday or today, when he said at the end, it will be a discussion between Ansarullah and STC without the Hadi side involved in this. This is the positioning of these battles. But these battles will continue as long as the war continue. The issue is not to focus on the battles, focus on the war, and focus on the external parties who are keeping the war going on. Thank you. If I may, Claire, please. Of course. Yeah. Uh, let me just tell you that I, people tend to, to, to talk about topics and, 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 and don't understand the UN 2140 resolution 2140 of 2014 is a banning resolution is about, about the transfer of arms, about ammunitions, about not to help the parties on the ground to continue. But the implementation was never there. I mean, no one, I mean, I, but, but the problem that we, in my, in, my, in my talk about, uh, about the panel of experts report, the latest one, I mentioned that all the smugglers are using liberated areas, are using lands of the government of Yemen to smuggle everything the Houthis need in their war. All the components of the drone. I mentioned that also all the, the technological advances of the, uh, the, the, the modern devices to be used in the drone, was coming from Germany and from Sweden. And this is the panel of experts saying, I'm not saying that. And no one was, is listening to me. And I'm telling you that, yes, we need to cut outside uh, support to the war 
uh, elements in Yemen, but no one is listening because there is no interest. Yemenis, for centuries, they, 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 they are experts in waging wars of proxies. And we need to end that to live in peace in our, in our country. And, and the Houthis are example of what's happening in Yemen. And uh, we need to stop that. Okay, um, thank you. We've got so many questions. I'm just wondering, uh, okay, I think we'll go to this one from uh, Laura Creatry, who asks, how has Oman changed its engagement in Yemen? Um, Noel, we haven't heard from you for a little while. I don't know if you feel able to answer that question. I feel like this one's for Summer because she spent so much time on Oman and she'll give you a better answer than I would. Okay, fabulous. Hi, sorry, I just unmuted. Um, so how has Oman's engagement changed? So it's changing slowly. I think uh, someone who's participating in the conference just posted a very, very recent current event that just took place today where Oman actually uh, facilitated uh, uh, a talk between Ansarullah and the US envoy to Yemen. So they, they are definitely historically and in Yemen's case specifically have always played the case of facilitator in the region. So it would be really great to see them continue in that role. What happened during, during Yemen's war is that they were not able to play that role because of the GCC's involvement in Yemen's war. Uh, so it's tough for them to, to keep being this uh, neutral facilitating force. So what we're seeing now, whether it's in Oman's case or on the regional international level, is in a sense the restoration of the world order as it existed prior to 2015. So GCC is one unit. The US is now not directly part of the conflict. They want to go back to diplomacy. So it is this shift to pre-2015 that we're seeing. Where is it going to go? Um, I'm not quite sure yet. OK, all right, thank you. Um, just a question really about recent events. So there was a donors meeting just last week um, in terms of donating money to Yemen which was short of a billion dollars. Perhaps Nawal, you're able to comment on this one, which is really what will be the impact, um, the humanitarian impact of that decision? It really is devastating. I mean, when we were making this film, you know, a huge um, part of it was the impact that aid cuts were already having uh, in, in, in Yemen. And, you know, we visited, what, you know, one of the biggest things that impacted the COVID response was that you know 10,000 doctors had stopped receiving this WHO supplement that they'd been receiving since this war began. Because they aren't receiving government salaries, doctors in Yemen are relying on these WHO supplem supplements that they get on a monthly basis. And aid cuts mean they're not receiving it anymore. We went to malnutrition clinics, which have uh, had their funding cut. Now, you know, children, we see a lot of uh, mal pictures of malnourished children in Yemen. Uh, now for a child to receive treatment, they have to make their own way to one of these clinics. And as soon as they leave, they receive no support whatsoever. Um, and so that makes the treatment they're receiving uh, just short-lived for lack of a better word because as soon as they leave those doors they have no support so now further aid cuts I think it's going to have um, it, you know it's really terrifying to think uh, what we're going to see next year as a result of these aid cuts. May I add something there if I may yeah I think the question of aid and generosity is a problem we, we uh, uh, perhaps uh, Sama remembers a, a meeting we were together in Washington, where post-war in Yemen, what do we do, we, 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 if you remember that. And I said in that meeting that it is not about giving aid to Yemen. It is about compensating Yemen. And com because that is different. Aid comes from the generosity of your heart. You have no obligation to give it. And if you give it, you can lay any conditions you want. And we have seen this disaster only a few days ago with the United Nations asking for $4 billion and getting less than two. And that $4 billion is nothing compared to what Yemen requires in terms of rebuilding. We see that when we are talking about aid and we are talking about generosity. What Yemen requires and what Yemen must get is compensation that is contracted and can be enforced by the force of law. That is what is required for your money. Not talk about generosity and charity. That is totally out of, out of it. 
uh, clear, uh, if I may. Do you know this, uh, this annual meeting of the United Nations uh, for the emergency plan for Yemen? It's, it's very important to show how much the international community is, uh, is stretched out uh, in, in other conflicts, Syria, other areas, Sudan, uh, Somalia, and, and you name it. And, 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 and from the beginning, it was the, the level of coverage. I mean, what, what the United Nations OCHA this time asked us for, are, as, as Munir mentioned, around 4 billion. And uh, what really they managed to, to ensure is around 1.67 1, 1. billion, uh, almost 1.7 uh, billion. It's, it's, it's nothing. But when you see that a huge chunk of population uh, in, in, in areas are now showing what we, we, have, we have pockets of famine in areas. In, in, in the north, in areas of Tehama, in everywhere in Yemen, it shows that the, the response of the international community is nothing in, compare, uh, in, in comparison to the, to, the, to, to the threat, the humanitarian catastrophe that unfolded uh, in front of us. And, uh, but that maybe Amunir is mentioning something very important, the obligations of the international community towards Yemen are much bigger than talking about these two billion or, or one billion. It's the obligation of, of rebuilding a nation, which, which is a, a serious obligation. But once we have a responsible, uh, united uh, government and we will decide the fate of that nation, of course, we will ask, but not beg uh, for, for, for international uh, responsibility to help Yemen rebuild itself. and, and and, and be part of the, 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 the peace uh, making in, in the region. Hey, Ms. Diamani, you I did mention just then, um, re sorry, Noel, if I can just quickly go on to this one and we'll certainly come back to you in a moment. Um, just to touch on what you mentioned, which was rebuilding the nation. Um, we've had a question from Angela Dewan, who, which, who's asking, what would peace in Yemen actually look like, bearing in mind there was a lot of conflict even before this war, and there were various groups. How on earth would peace look in reality? Is it realistic? Yeah. In international law, uh, there is no recognition of militias to be ruling a nation. So we cannot accept, and this is maybe uh, others will not accept uh, my, my, my opinion, but international law never recognize militias and, and, and non-state actors to represent a nation. Yemen will be a, a, a very solid, uh, country by having, by coming back into its democratic practices, by having a democratic say of its people, who will be uh, ruling that nation, this will be the, 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 the right of the Yemenis to decide uh, through democratic process. This is number one. Second, Yemen cannot accept that a militia like Hezbollah control the faith of the nation and kidnap the entire nation. Look what's happening in Lebanon. And Lebanon is something that is, is really miserable to, to turn that beautiful country into a, a, a case of, 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 of hatred and fighting and killing on a daily basis under the name of the state of Lebanon. So we cannot accept that Yemen is being controlled by the Houthis. Houthis can transform into a political movement and they can have as far as they could uh, grab through the, 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 the democratic process through elections. And they can have very influence, uh, influence in, 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 in regions. They cannot have influence in other regions. And also the same is applicable to STC. And the same is applicable to all these movements that, that appeared in the, in the liberated areas and, and contributed to the fragmentation, uh, fragmentation of the liberated areas, which will have to come into and understanding that the population of Yemen will decide. And, and, and I do agree with, the, with, with, uh, with others here that, that Yemen always has the, the, the external connections. And we need to, to, to try to lessen that influence of external uh, 
uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, influence into 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 Yemeni politics because we need to agree on the format, and in that format, we have the national dialogue uh, outcome, which we discuss it together. I think the Houthis agree on like ninety percent of that uh, document. Uh, some uh, say that no, they are not agreeing on the federal structure. They are not agreeing on that on this. But we have an agreement. We have an agreement with the Houthis. We don't want to let the Houthis go into kidnapping the entire nation, deciding the fate of a nation through war and bloody confrontation. We want to sit down and agree on how to live together in peace and how to give hopes to the Yemeni people. Okay, um, Mr. Yemani, we might just... Um, Samar, you have raised your hand virtually. If I can give the mic to you for a moment. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, in this discussion, we're, we're heading in a fruitful direction into what would peace look like in Yemen and what does the peace process need to look like? And I think um, Sir Munir touched on the fact that rebuilding Yemen and aid has to be part of the peace process. It needs to be demanded and signed into the peace process so that Yemenis don't have to ask for it in the future. It needs to be written in there. But I think one of the things that we need to look at, and Mr. Al Yemani here uh, also alluded to this, that we have processes in place. There are democratic practices that Yemen can kind of go back to. But I think in the immediate term, what we need to see is a ceasefire uh, followed by the creation of a new government, but it has to take into account the realities of the ground. You know, to come into a discussion and say that, for example, and I, and I see a chat in the chat that someone was mentioning the Southern Transitional Council, to say that the Southern Transitional Council will suddenly not play a role or needs to be not involved in this would be unrealistic. So it needs to be a phased out process where Yemenis, for example, have not um, practiced their democratic rights in a while. Yemen's parliament has not had elections in you know almost forever. I mean, as long as I remember being an adult, I don't remember any parliamentary uh, elections. And the only presidential election that actually took place was a, a superficial election where everybody voted for president had the to allow for a transition to occur. So to imagine that the war would end and that a restoration of democratic uh, practices would just occur in Yemen is very unrealistic and we have to phase them in and prepare the population. So before we talk about, uh, you know, how the rule of law would occur in Yemen, I think we need to elevate uh, and take the pressure off Yemenis who have to, had to suffer without food and water and access to healthcare. We have to ease them in into restoring their dignity and restoring faith in them as civilians and citizens. And then to, we, we have a responsibility to make sure that the path continues in the right direction. And, and Claire, you know, this is, not, this is not something new. I agree with, uh, with Sama and Munir. In international law, uh, through uh, United Nations, we had a lot of experiences that, uh, for example, we have the Timor-Leste, we have uh, in Africa, countries in Africa uh, that went through terrible, uh, uh, for example, in, 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 the, in the long war of the Tutsi and the Hutu uh, in, in Africa, the killing, the carnage, and nevertheless, they, they managed to, to, to lead together and managed to create their democracy. The, 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 the international law established uh, steps towards gradually come into uh, a democratic process or a representation of the people. And we have ex ex experiences and we, we, we should not be, I mean, thinking that we will reinvent the wheel. It's already there and we can use all instruments of international law in order to regain our statehood. Okay, we've got a question here from um, Najo Al-Khaladi who's asking, um, does any, do any of the panelists believe that the two-state solution could be the solution to the conflict? If I can leave that uh, open to whoever might um, agree with that idea. I, I think that many people have different opinions, and I think many people would agree to a two-state solution, especially the ones living on the ground and and you know affiliating with certain types of forces on the ground that feel that they earned you know the right to be independent in this conflict. But I think that it is something that should not be decided right away. It is something that um, Yemen needs to heal first, and I think that these conversations should always have a platform and be encouraged to, to, to in allow Yemenis to talk about what they feel is in their right or not in their right. But I think without the um, 
without addressing the grievances of the Yemeni people, you will always get a biased answer. Once Yemenis are healed and their grievances are heard, they might make different choices. And I, and I think we've seen that in other parts of the world. Okay, Mr. Saeed, you're raising your hand on that one. Yes, uh, I, I think I have I have dealt with this in my article that Yemen has never has always never been successfully ruled by a centralized government. This will never happen again. And we have had several discussions on a federation. The, 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 what has been put forward and is still on the table is six state federation, but that is not going to happen in any time soon because I think the forces against that are too much. One of the reasons we are in a war is because of that. But a, a two-state a two state solution, as Samar has indicated, is probably going to be the way forward. And what is important is that we Yemenis must be prepared to discuss everything and put everything on the table without preconditions. No ceilings, no flaws. Everything is possible on the table because at the end of the day, the ending the war and finding peace and finding coexistence between the various ethnicities of Yemenis in, in one country. Yemen is a large country with different people. Finding a, the, the, the formula to coexist together as a country is what is primary and not the structure of government. But centralized government is out of question. Uh, uh, Claire, if I may, please. Um, you know, something that we, we have in our short memory uh, we keep repeating uh, mistakes because we, we don't go to our, our history. And, and during uh, almost one year, we discussed in the national dialogue every, every component and every grievances of the past. And, 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 and we, we touch on 60, 70 years of, of, of Yemeni history and grievances. And I agree with, with, with Sama that we need to have this uh, platform open all the time to talk, uh, the real talk about uh, our future, how to uh, coexist uh, and, and, and accommodate each other, what best forms. And, and I think that uh, no one is talking today about a, a, a strong central government. Even, even the National Dialogue was talking about a federal government with a very strong uh, uh, federal structure. And, 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 and maybe the mistake was deciding six units or seven units or five units and uh, of that. But uh, I'm, I'm from the South, I'm from Aden. That's why I decided not to take the initiative talk about the two state solution. Maybe people tend to talk nostalgically about the South and the North. And I think it's not functional anymore. Even people in the South are not agreeing to be under the control of, 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 of some, some regions and, and, and being, being subjected to, to, to a lot of exploitation in the past, a lot of, of killings, a lot of uh, uh, massacres by, by people in, in specific regions. So why Hadramot should pay the heavy price of coming back to South Yemen? Why? Somebody should explain that to me. I mean, that's why I think that we need to think out of the box first recover our statehood and, and recover peace and tranquility in Yemen. And in that I agree with Sama. And then we sit down and discuss everything. I like uh, to sit next to, to you. I like to talk to Munir. I don't want to live with Munir. This will be a discussion that we can take it and when it's time uh, to talk about it. But first, cessation of hostilities, as everybody can agree, we need to stop this war and next we'll be talking the talk and, and, and look how we can manage to live together again. Okay, um, unfortunately in a whole hour has passed and we've barely scratched the surface. Um, clearly we need the whole day to talk about this topic. Um, if we can just have maybe just a very short concluding remark from each of you, I'd like you to think about what's the one thing that needs to happen to enable a path to peace to even be possible? Is it perhaps the US? Is it local actors? Just tell me one one key aspect that needs to be addressed. If we can start perhaps with you, Mr. Mr. Said. Get the foreign player, get the external players out of Yemen's affairs. Let Yemenis sit around the table themselves. We have had many wars in the past. 
They have not lasted more than a few weeks. We sat around the table. We didn't get the 100% solution, but we got a solution. Now, the only wars that lasted as long as this did are the ones where external players were directly involved. Okay. Um, That's Noel, what is required. Thank you. Thank you, Munir. I'm going to reiterate what uh, Mr. Munir said. The external players, as soon as they pull out of this war, there will be many less Yemenis with power who are making too much money from this conflict and have too much personal interest to keep this conflict going. And we've been saying this for the last six years. Had it happened six years ago, the Houthis would have a much less power right now that we're trying to take off them. And uh, many Yemenis wouldn't be starving, wouldn't have had their houses bombed in the process. Um, but it's never too late. Um, but the first step has to be for the external powers to, um, to, to you know, uh, stop their involvement. Okay, thank you. Samal? We are seeing a lot of things that are heading in the right direction. The main message to the local actors is to seize the moment, carpe diem. But I want to steal a comment from one of the from one of the attendees. Uh, I actually saw in the chat. It says we might need to have a strong leadership of the internationally recognized government about talking of state building. And I think that's really important uh, moving forward to have the government not um, to kind of have a strong strong will to peace and to have a strong urge from that side to also want to engage in the peace building process. And I think that's from uh, Sara Al-Ariqi. I just want to mention that I, I thought I want to include voices of the attendees in this as well and not just my voice. Okay, fabulous. And Mr. Okay. Yamani, uh, one last comment. Again, again on, on, on the last uh, just uh, remark, uh, we need to unite the P5. We need to send a very strong message from the international community, from the Security Council on the need to end this war in Yemen. And this is very important because this, the message is not united. What you hear in Moscow is not the same what we hear from, from Washington. And we think that the administration can help uh, by easing uh, uh, these sort of tensions you know, within the P5. We need also, as, as uh, everyone here mentioned, we need a, a, a regional disengagement uh, in Yemen and also we need also to keep an eye on something that is that the auto dynamics of, of every civil war is very important. The warlords, the war economy, those that will keep pushing back. They don't want to stop this war because the war is a bonanza for them. The war is the life for them. So no one will, will ask, accept that you will take his life easily. They will keep pushing back and they have billions and billions out of the miseries of the Yemenis. We need to focus on, 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 on the international level, the, the regional level, but the, 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 the local, the national level is the most complicated after six years of war. Now we are entering seven years of war. And if we miss this opportunity, we will end up having 10 years, 15 years of war, and no one will, 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 will take care of their many concerns because Somalia next door was an example, vivid example of what happened. Okay. Thank you so much to you. The narrative, well. the narrative has to change as well. We need to change the narrative. And this was just a question that was sent to me just now, why I refuse to use Houthi and I always use Ansarullah. Because the whole timing it is Houthis is giving this war a sectarian image, which it doesn't have. This war is about politics, about power struggle, about different factions in Yemen. Each one of them wants to rule Yemen. That's what this war is all about. And therefore we have to change the narrative in order to be able to identify the real problem of this war and be able to solve it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now our panelists will have the chance to have a little bit more of a discussion, but we're going to take it offline for the next uh, 20 minutes, half an hour. So I just want to say thank you so much for everyone who attended today. It's been absolutely amazing to hear all your questions, all your comments, and to see how passionate everybody is. Um, you can continue the conversation um, at Fair Observer. You can sign up for our newsletter, subscribe to our channel, um, follow us on social media, and of course you can publish with us as well. So please do join us and become a Fair Observer. Thank you very much.
it's really just a chance for everyone to decompress a bit and just give us their thoughts. I mean, we did have a comment from a couple of people saying they felt that it was a little one sided. I don't know how you all felt about um, which side is it? Yeah, <laughs> it's the, t it's the usual myself. thing that I saw where where is the <laughs> southern representation? And I say, Munir and Khaled are from Aden. What do you mean by southern? <laughs> because there's no secessionist. There is no pro-secessionist. There is no pro stc or here. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's not a question. I mean, the STC phenomena, we all know that we, we, we cannot fly. We know that. And, and I, we, I mean, from day one, when I went before the establishment of STC, I went to Abu Dhabi and I started talking to them, not as a representative of the government, as somebody from Aden. I know they are all my brothers. I know them personally. Uh, and I told them that if they can transform into the umbrella for open discussion in the South, they can gain momentum. But they, they just, they managed to get themselves the financing, the recognition, and they create this, uh, I mean, it's, it's the same way. Why we say the Houthis are, 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 are a militia and they are against the law, and we, it's not applicable to the SD. It's the same. It's the same. They are all using uh, this war to empower themselves. So the only way for them to be legitimate is to go through the process. That, that I know that the Riyadh agreement gives them some sort of recognition, but the problem that they understand that this recognition is over the South. I mean, I mean, I'm telling you, it's the, the problem is that the, the, the war has given power and recognition to people. In fact, the Saudi intervention has made Ansarullah more recognizable, more relevant than ever, ever in the past. This is one of the problems. So when you create a war against a party, you immediately give that party an importance it did not have before. You want to remove the importance of that party, stop fighting it. One of these old the past that I've had years, that like you said, uh, yes. said, Munir, you know, it's given them so much power and you just have to see the reality on the ground when you're thinking of what is the pathway to peace. You can't ignore the reality on the ground. Absolutely. And I remember us having this discussion, uh, Mr. Khaled, when we were talking during the peace talks, I think in 2017, the only thing the aerial campaign has done is given the Houthis power, given the ability, the Houthis uh, or Ansarullah, the ability to recruit on the ground and to mm -hmm. gain momentum. And, and that's not going to go away. No, you know, UN process is going to make that go away. The reality is that they are Yemenis, they are in power, they are in control of most of Yemen. And so they have to be a part of a peace process and they have to be a part of whatever representation will represent Yemen on the, you know, to come. But the government and, you know, the Yemeni government has been absent. They have no power on the ground. If they had power, they would have been back five years ago. Uh, the moment they, they landed in Aden, they were attacked. Um, so I think you, you really have to take notice of the reality on the ground. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Noel, you know that I mentioned that more than one time in my last piece, the one before the Atlantic Council, I keep saying that if we need to celebrate something is the coming back of the government to Aden. <laughs> I mean, after six years, now the government is in Aden. And if you, if you just ask what's happening in Aden, you see half of that people who went back to Aden, now they, they went back to those who are in Egypt and in Riyadh and all Do you really that. think they're still relevant? Do you really think they're still relevant? Yeah, yeah. I think to, to, to balance the equation in Yemen, you need to have the government of the Yemenis, the legitimate government of the Yemenis, back in Yemen. They need but I'm asking you, I'm asking you, even yeah, yeah. if we are back in Yemen. I will, I will come back to your uh, Munir. But if you feel the suffering of the Yemeni people, you live with them, you try to service the nation, so everybody will respect you. You bring a model about, about what's the difference between the Houthis, uh, I mean, I mean uh, iron fist uh, practices in the north and the kidnapping of people, the killing of people, using force, forcing villagers to, 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 
to 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 recruit in their in their in their in their ranks and and and, and the opposite you need to bring hope to Yemeni that this is your government working for you and helping you but if you are not in Yemen nobody will respect you nobody will 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 will, will give any interest in, in in all your rhetorics and that's why i'm telling you this the, the equation the, the balance was was tilted towards the houthis because they are in yemen and they are, they, 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 they pretend that they are defending yemen they are not defending yemen and I remember one of these old discussions I had with the leadership of the Houthis in New York. And they said, look, Khalid, why you are defending the government of Yemen? Uh, we, in the history of Yemen, everyone knows that the power is taken by force. Read the history of Yemen. Through the history of Yemen, who is, the, the victorious is through, through blood and, and, and fire, is not, is not through democracy. So now, once we control, we will give you the sudden movement, we will give you recognition in the government, or we will give you positions in the government, but we will govern Yemen. And I said, no, we came from Yemen. My dad was part of the colonial service and, and we were part of the establishment. We were not defending even uh, People's Democratic Republic of Yemen. We are defenders of the establishment. If you ask Munir why he was in Yemen, because you say part of the clerk, part of the system, the establishment of the state. We went to Sana'a defending the establishment, not defending Saleh or defending uh, uh, this name or that. Or, that's why we cannot accept to be out of the establishment. We need establishment recognized by all the people of Yemen. This is the idea. What do you think should be the role? What do you think should be the role of independent political uh, uh, Yemenis who are political? The independents who are not part partisan in this peace process. Sama, Sama, Sama just mentioned that that the platform should be open for all movements and I mean, I mean there is now there is a, 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 a lot of focus on on the government and the Houthis, but uh, we need to recognize also others. What's happening with the, the STC? What's happening with other uh, other other form, uh, formations in the in the, in the in the south, what's happening in the, in the east coast, what's happening here and there. Everyone should uh, come and, 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 and talk the, and, uh, the, 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 the future of this uh, country. Because, but the, the most important element of it, as we all agree, we need to stop this war and try to bring everyone on board to talk the peace. I think, I just wanna add something really simple. Uh, based on what you're saying. I think, yes, it's, you know, the first step has to be the cessation of hostilities, but the second step has to be that once one party is not legitimate over the other. And I think that's mm -hmm. where Yemen went wrong, where everything went wrong from the very beginning is that someone decided, and I hate to say it, but it was probably UN resolution 2216, that one warring party in this conflict was more legitimate than the other. And that's mm -hmm. how we got into this mess in the first place. And until that's reversed, we're not going to get out of this mess. Um, but I mean, that's just in my humble opinion, because I just don't think it's reflective of the forces on the ground. And until we face up to who's actually in power on the ground and how they've gained their power, we're not going to be able to resolve this. Um, because if you're yeah. in power and you have the arms and you're it's able to fight, why would you stop and give them up? And who are we and the, that the Yemeni government is the legitimate government? I can assure you that there isn't one Yemeni in any part of Yemen that sees the legitimate Yemeni government as the government in control or as the power that has their back. Um, well said. I think unless we face up to that, there won't be a peaceful resolution. Yeah, I think I think this is this is why this is why future negotiations symbolically need to be held on a round table and not a rectangular table. A, a round table that symbolizes that all the warring parties are on equal level. The whole concept of an existence of a state and legitimacy has been given a totally different meaning out of this war, thrown out of the window. We have warring parties, as you have said, and I agree with you completely, Noel. And I, and I think we have we have a case of of I'm, I'm sorry for interrupting. I just I just want to say that we have a 
a case of what not to do. I know that for a lot of people who participated in the National Dialogue Conference and in the, the, the dialogue that was supposed to take place and, and help Yemen avoid conflict, I think that we have a learning scenario here of what not to do. And I think what we, what we should not do is involve 556 members for an eight, nine month process that may or may not be fruitful to rewrite the constitution and aim so high when, for example, the constitution of Yemen was not that problematic and we could have just amended sections within which could have been possible through the work of the parliament uh, in Yemen. I think moving forward in the future, I would like to see a lot less UN guided processes. And I would like to see a lot more informal discussions happening between different Yemenis who are ready to talk and, and see eye to eye with each other. I think once they've talked, once they actually engage with each other, I mean, we're Yemenis, we're Arab, there's a lot of, we have to look into our tribal background and how these talks are historically held and negotiated engaging Yemenis in a process that's so fancy and structured and not part of our uh, collective psyche or our heritage is not going to be as fruitful as allowing Yemenis to sit and talk to each other. And then once a solution is ready and ripe, you present it to the public, you endorse it, you engage them in a UN process and you set it forward. And I think here's the risk of, of having the UN be too involved. I think Nawal uh, touched on United Nations Security Council Resolution 2216 as something that was an obstacle at some point. Now they're looking at updating it and changing it. Um, and then that's also causing and stirring debate. And I think we've come to the point where, okay, what's next? What? Let's imagine a ceasefire. What takes place from there? And for me, the most important thing is to start elevating the humanitarian catastrophe by easing the stress on the economy by reopening airports, by removing certain sieges for allowing aid to flow in in a, in a smoother way. And that will also help prepare the ground in Yemen to be ripe for peace. Those are great indicators of building trust, of engaging the community that a peace process is coming and that they should have faith in, in, in the next steps. I, I, I also want to say, Claire, something very important in, in international law. I refer you to to the concept of legitimacy in international law. Mm -hmm. People tend to, to compare this legitimacy uh, with international legitimacy. Uh, legitimacy is not, is not uh, a chapeau that you put whenever you want to empower yourself. No, no. Legitimacy is, is, is linked to, to being the servant of the people. Legitimacy is linked to being uh, presenting more sacrifices for, 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 for the people of Yemen. And I'm not defending uh, the legitimacy, but, but I'm telling you, you might be happy, not happy. And also I will refer you to the discussion that took place in 2012, uh, 2013 in Yemen, and you were there uh, about uh, is Hadi legitimate or not? And Houthis turn the, the table on everyone. Hadi is legitimate until he transformed and pass the, 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 the batuta, they call it in Latino, of power to the new president. Uh, and, and there were a discussion in parliament, there were discussion in, in the national dialogue. Uh, is, is, it, is he elected for four years or for 10 years? And then they decided, no, he was not elected. He was legitimately, uh, legitimately elected uh, as the president of the Yemenis until he he really transferred power to, to the new uh, uh, elected president. I, so I think this is the agreement of Yemeni. If you don't <laughs> agree, this is the I, uh, he, He's not happy. He's not happy with legitimacy. No, I, I, think, I think it's ironic how this legitimacy worked. I mean, yeah, I know, I know. it was questioned in February 2014, which is actually the end of the two year transitional period that existed in Yemen. And there were questions about legitimacy. But fast forward to today, what happens if we lose President Hadi? Then the entire government and this entire legitimacy bubble that we've built around him would crumple with him too. So now we need President Hadi more than ever yeah. to ensure yeah. that yeah. peace yeah. occur. And that's ironic, really you ironic. Right, you are right, Sama. And what will happen then if we just, I mean, let that structure uh, go down? Then we will have only the Houthis as a well-organized non-state actor, uh, militias, uh, terrorists uh, taking, taking control and the state will not have any representation. We need to stick and I always will repeat what, what Dr. Abdul Karim Iriani, my 
master and my educator and my role model in life who keep saying, and he was not happy by, by what happened in Yemen, but he said if legitimacy is a very, I mean, very thin stick in the, in the corner of this room, I will keep grabbing that legitimacy because this will bring me back to, to the statehood because I cannot accept all this. I mean, the fragmentation in Yemen, the Salafis that appear like everywhere in the South, in, the, in, in, in Ta'iz, in everywhere, the Houthis that they are extremists in their views. The, uh, I mean, all the, 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 the all this mo uh, Islamic views of, 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 of life and, and imposing life upon Yemenis, we only can correct this by reestablishing the state, using all, uh, I mean, Always you say, okay, the legitimacy will, will run the country in the future. No, of course. We need to agree. We need to use the platform of legitimacy to go on, to pass on to the, to the new administration. But we cannot accept that the Houthis decide the future of, of Yemenis. We cannot accept that Hezbollah is dictating the future of Yemen. This will be, I mean, terrible to accept that a militia will decide what we should yeah, do. I don't I don't think anyone is saying that the militia should decide and I don't think we need to keep going back to that point because I think now you just raised two important issues about legitimacy one uh which you mentioned Dr. Uh, Abdel Karim Al Iriani who I also met and talked to and I guarantee you for sure that he would not be happy and endorse the current legitimacy that exists in Yemen had he lived and then two uh, the legitimacy that you talked about is, in fact, a contributing actor in the sectarianism and the social divides that we see today in Yemen. They fed it with all their force in their war narrative, in the way that they led their economic policies in Yemen, in the way they discriminated against the population held hostage under certain militias on the ground. The legitimacy divided the country and helped contribute to that. Now, talking about legitimacy, I can't even talk about it as a cohesive unit. What am I talking about? Am I talking about the Islah faction in the government? Am I talking about the new elite? that were created during the National Dialogue Conference. Who am I exactly talking about? And are their interests still united or are they as fractured as every other group? Unfortunately, the reality is the strongest force on the ground, the only group that has maintained a cohesive uh, policy, a cohesive approach forward is the Houthi militia. And as much as we don't like them to continue ruling forward, they have actual grasp and hold on the ground. So we have to be flexible not, not for their sake, but for the sake of millions of Yemenis who are desperate for peace, for the sake of future generations who ultimately, if the Houthi regime is to change and be reversed, the revolution has to come from them, not from Saudi Arabia and the UAE, who are not genuinely interested in what happens to Yemen, who are monarchies who don't want to endorse democratic transitions and processes in the region only in appearance. We have, you know, we, Yemen before the war, we were far more advanced politically than any of these countries are, are racing to, to achieve in these in these past few years. So we have to take that into consideration. Yeah, if we I may, if I may, start. That we are a democratic nation and we have democratic values and we ended up, I mean, in such a devastation that is very sad, really. I'm, I'm not may... defending the government of Yemen. I'm, 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 I'm not part of the government, but I'm, I'm trying to, to, to tell you my experience through the UN and, 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 and all the experience that I went through the, the international law. And I know how, how, how we can regain statehood if we, we don't recognize the UN resolution. Let's if just I give, may, yeah. re really quick, one quick question, which is kind of, you know, the elephant in the room and something that, that we haven't touched upon, but it's very important in the, uh, in the Yemeni sphere. And this is one of the main reasons why we insisted in inviting Sama and, and, and Nawal to the podcast, make sure that there was representation. And that's the role of women in this whole entire thing. You know, we've seen uh, the 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 crisis that erupted in December when there were no women included in, 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 in the coalition government. And then we saw in the new UN Security Council resolution um, encouraging all actors to you, you, you know, include women and, and put them in the front of the uh, uh, of this process. How do you see a the inclusion of women? B what role should they play in the in 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 this process? And you know, go for it. Who would be? Who are the voices? You know that, just that briefly on that. We're we're finishing in about a minute's time, so oh, I'm not oops. sure. <laughs> If, if, if I may, Claire, because I received 
three calls this morning from friends from uh, the, the uh, I mean, woman activists, and they ask me uh, whether the special envoy has uh, emphatically emphasized the, the, the need of woman participation in every negotiation. Yes. And, uh, and, 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 and every letter the, the special envoy would write to the government and to the Houthis, and the Houthis, they are not recognizing, of course, that uh, they, they ask for woman participation in, in every meeting. But unfortunately, no one at the end, you see one representative to the, to, in the group. And, 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 and I wrote to President Hadi, and I talked to them. If you said that you recognize the outcome of the national dialogue, now you should give the woman 30% of the, of the quota in every uh, level of state. And we, no have, we have got 50% here. Can I just say, let, let's hear from a woman on this. <laughs> Noel, we haven't heard your voice for a long time. Noel, maybe. I'm gonna, I want to hear from Sama first. Sorry, go ahead. I just... I'm, I'm happy to jump in on this. I think we have two things happening. One, uh, that forces on the ground in Yemen are competing with this female representation where the Houthis actually boosted and bragged that they had more women than the than the legitimate government of Yemen. And I think that's interesting. I'd like to, I personally would like to see more of that. I would like to see them compete by adding as many women as possible into this role. But I also think that the Hadi government step was actually a more honest and genuine step in the sense that they are showing all their cards on the table and saying that we we don't really care about the female voice. We don't really care about their participation. And I think ever since 2011, women were used as um, just tokens, really, of, of whatever messaging that we need. Oh, this message is so important. We even have women calling it. Women and youth issues continue to get the most funding in Yemen throughout the conflict because it is a token. It's a tokenism issue. But as you can see here in today's panel, Yemeni women are educated, Yemeni women are capable, and Yemeni women will fight and will succeed in achieving the roles that they need to achieve, and they will have a seat at the table. Okay. All right, yeah, I wanted Sama to go first, sorry, Claire, but I just wanted to add to what Sama said. And I mean, in this last six years of reporting, a lot of my work has focused on the incredible, the incredible impact women have had in this conflict. And it hasn't been intentional. It hasn't been to tick a box that I want to cover female stories. It just so happens that it's been females that have been leading um, you know, the, the peaceful, peaceful initiatives or just initiatives on the ground. Whether it's in my most recent film, when I talk about that hospital in Aden, where every single doctor fled, the three people who have remained were Dr. Zoha and two female nurses, remained unpaid and were treating COVID-19 patients against all odds. And then um, we covered Dr. Makia and Dr. Ashwak Muharram, who have been leading um, leading in, in uh, the malnutrition situation in Yemen. And then also you have Radhiya al Mutwakil who started Muwatana. It's been the only organization who's been looking into human rights abuses on the ground in Yemen. And now they're being um, nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize. So I think women have been playing a leading role, but it just so happens that they're continuously uh, silenced in Yemen. And it's unfortunate because if they are brought to the forefront, I think we'll see more distinguished voices uh, coming through. Okay, everybody. It's can... enough. Can I, it's can, enough. Can I... It's enough to remind everybody here. <laughs> it's enough to remind everybody here that the best times in Yemen history was when Yemen was ruled by the Queen of Sheba Bilqis and Queen Arwa as -Sulahi. These two queens of Yemen remain until today the best example of leadership in Yemen. They wow. have. They. We just need to go through the history, and that's. More than a thousand years ago, say, that's but going back a long way now. I'm not sure. That absolutely, that. but it just goes to show that we have a history. We have a history <gasps> of accepting Yemeni oh. leadership, uh, women leadership. This is not new for us. Okay. And tomorrow, I will be proud to see okay. a Yemeni woman running for president. Arsul, do you want to have the last word, and then we'll wrap up? No, I don't want to have the last word. I want to thank everyone. I would say that this has been the most lively discussion I've been. Um, witness to, and I was listening in rapt attention. And uh, I would like, I've sent, I think, all of you LinkedIn invites, um, and I, I don't know uh, if you've got them, but I'll, I'll make sure I check again. Um, and uh, I would love for all of you to be back. I would love for all of you to write for us, uh, not just be speakers. I'm currently in Florida. Uh, that's why the leaves and all that, as you can see. Uh, but I still tuned in. Um, I don't know if uh, 
Sama, you're in Washington, aren't you? Oh, sorry. I, I live sorry, in you're Washington. Muted. I'm in Europe at the moment. I see, I see. Well, if any of you are in Washington, which is where I'll be the next uh, couple of months, three months at least, I'm just here for a break. Um, let me know. Uh, we, we, we'll walk and talk, or if you like to be more sedentary, we'll, we'll have coffee. Uh, and uh, please spread the word. Look, we are independent. We are a nonprofit. We don't have the money of Washington Post. That's backed by Jeff Bezos. We don't have the money of bigger publications. And we are trying to do interesting stuff. So what we need from all of you is to get your friends to sign up for our newsletter, follow us on social media, that sort of stuff. Because the word of mouth campaign is what we are focused on to grow. Uh, really, I mean, they, we created it completely out of a shoestring, uh, completely out of a shoestring. Claire is doing all of this uh, from a tiny flat in, in, in uh, London. She doesn't have any of the AFP's resources she once had. I don't have any of the law firm resources that I once had when I was a corporate lawyer in London. So, so we'll, we need all of you. I'll shut up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Enjoy, enjoy Margot Lauro. With <laughs>